So the book began on election night 2016. About that night was, for me, bright daylight, because I was in Kyoto, in fact, to receive the, the Kyoto Prize after a joyful send-off from my friends back home. I was feeling anxious about the bitterly divided US electorate, and yet reasonably confident that appeals to fear and anger would be repudiated, although there would be a lot of work to do to put the country back together. My Japanese hosts kept coming in and out of the room, expressing, of course, happiness, and, but yet in the background, with the TV on in the background, but in the forefront of my mind was the terrible election news. So the experience that gave rise to the book was really an experience of this strange contrast between the emotions of joy and gratitude that I knew I ought to express and the terrible fear that I had to conceal, which really was a fear that I knew was disproportionate and not quite rational. So that was part of the problem that I was worried about but the fear for the uh, nation and its people. By the time the result was clear, I had to go out and appear even more joyful and celebratory in a bright, I must say, a blue suit, so that was certainly a fortunate choice. <laughs> but, um, but it was quite a chore to bottle up the fear. So when I got back to the hotel room, I did start thinking about fear and what I really wanted to say about the emotions that produced this electoral result. And I had a, an insight that was quite self-critical, which was that my previous approach to the emotions, which had been to study emotions like disgust, anger, and envy more or less one by one, in separate books even, was not quite right, and that what I needed to do was to talk about interactions a lot more and to see behind them all, a formative role of fear that not only was primary in evolutionary terms and also developmentally, but was an emotion that infested the other emotions, anger, disgust, and envy. And so really pretty soon, while I was still in Kyoto, I had written the proposal for this book, and then I got going. And you know, maybe if I had had my friends nearby and I'd been able to hug them, I wouldn't have had that feeling of isolation and the need to just say something to myself and think, think about something. So there is a lot of fear around, not only in the US, but in all the world's democracies. And this fear is often mingled with anger, blame, and envy. Fear all too often blocks rational deliberation, poisons hope, and impedes constructive cooperation for a better future. So what is this fear about? And I'm now just going to focus on the US, but of course, mutatis mutandis, I think it can be applied to other countries. Many Americans feel themselves powerless, out of control of their own lives. They fear for their own future and that of their children. They fear that that nebulous thing, the American dream, the idea that your children will flourish and do even better than you have done, has died and everything has slipped away from them. These feelings have their basis in very real problems, in particular income <coughs> stagnation in the lower middle class, alarming declines in the health and longevity of members of that class, particularly male, the changes in employment that brought by automation and outsourcing, which have meant that the jobs that are there, and of course we are doing pretty well at full employment, but the jobs that are there are jobs that require a higher level of education than members of that class traditionally got, so they feel uh, powerless and devalued. It's easy to convert that sense of panic and impotence into anger and blame of outsider groups such as immigrants, racial minorities, and women. And one of the things I do in the group is, in the book is to study that dynamic that turns from fear into blame and scapegoating and, in effect, witch hunting. They have taken our jobs. They are infesting our country. So fear leads to aggressive othering strategies rather than to useful analysis. At the same time, fear also runs rampant among people on the left who seek laudable goals, greater economic equality, 
and the vigorous protection of hard-won rights for women and minorities. But there's also this sense of panic that I see in my students that I think does not conduce to constructive solutions. The, the fear runs ahead of the constructive pursuit of the laudable goals. My students really do feel like it's the last days in the book of Revelation, and they're the righteous remnant who have to contend against satanic forces. Well, I think we all need to first take a deep breath and remember some history, and even recent history. When I was a little girl in the 50s, it was the McCarthy era and communists and non-communists too, just anyone who sort of vaguely looked like a leftist was being hounded out of their job in the academy and in Hollywood and, and so on. African Americans were being lynched in the South. Women were just beginning to enter prestigious universities and the workforce. And sexual harassment was a ubiquitous offense that had as yet no name. Jews could not win partnerships in major US law firms. Gays and lesbians, criminals under the law, were almost always in the closet, except in the professional theater. And as a, an actress, I, I was briefly a professional actress, and I saw the you know, enormous irrationality and cruelty of the closet when I got to know openly gay and lesbian actors in the theater. People with disabilities had no rights to public space and public education. Transgender was a category that had as yet no name. So America, for which my students are nostalgic because they don't really remember very much history, was far from beautiful. So these facts tell us a couple of things that my students need to know. First, the America for which they're nostalgic never existed, not really. It was a work in progress, a set of dynamic aspirations put in motion by tough work cooperation and hope over a long period of time. A just and inclusive America never was and is not yet a fully achieved reality. And I think we can still, and we can, even though Britain was well ahead of the US in some respects, decriminalizing homosexual relations in 1967 rather than 2005, nonetheless, there in the 50s, it was pretty much the same thing as the uh, terrible history of Alan Turing reminds us all. Second, this present moment may look like backsliding from our march toward equality, but it isn't the apocalypse. It is actually a time when hope and work can accomplish quite a lot. So on both left and right, panic doesn't just exaggerate our present dangers. It also makes our moment look more dangerous than it actually is. It's sort of like a bad marriage in which fear, suspicion, and blame displace discussion of what the real problems are and how to fix them. And then those emotions, unexamined, become their own problem, preventing constructive listening and cooperation. Americans remember FDR's statement, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And in his last public speech as president, President Obama said something like that. He said, democracy can buckle if we give way to fear. And he's talked about fear quite a lot subsequently. Now, of course, Roosevelt was wrong if we take his words literally. The Americans and other people, too, had a lot to fear in the 1930s other than fear. Nazism, hunger, and social unrest among them. Fear of those evils was rational, and to that extent, I think we should not always fear our fear, though we should always examine it. But Obama's more precise and modest statement seems to me surely right. It's always bad to give way to fear, drifting with its currents, refusing skeptical examination. We need to think hard about fear and where fear is leading us, but since people are not convinced right away that that really is a good way of approaching our present problems, I invent in the book, and I'll do a version of it here, a little dialogue between me and a skeptic, whom I call D for defender of fear. And this is a skeptical voice that I often hear in my colleagues and in our wonderful community where I get the best and toughest criticism. So D says, but look, we don't want to extinguish fear. Without fear, we'd all be dead. Fear is useful, propelling us to life-saving action. So Martha says, well, of course, you're right there. 
But fear has a very strong tendency to get ahead of us, propelling us into selfish, heedless, and antisocial actions. I'll try to show that this tendency comes from its evolutionary history and its psychological structure. More than other emotions, fear needs careful scrutiny if it's not to turn poisonous. Well, Dee says I'll need to be convinced, but I also want to know right now why you say that fear is particularly dangerous to democratic self-government. Surely, democracies are often well advised to consult fear in thinking of how to structure laws and institutions. Isn't our defense establishment a sensible response to the legitimate fear of foreign domination? And what about, for example, the US Constitution, but other founding documents in other countries? Weren't the framers guided by fear when they wrote the Bill of Rights? After all, they were writing down all the things the British had taken away from them, and they wanted to prevent those things from happening in the new nation. So that fear of domination was actually a good guide to the protection of human rights. Well, then Martha says, well, of course, it would be stupid to deny that fear often gives good guidance. But those examples involve fear filtered through careful and extended public deliberation. You've omitted hasty and ill-justified military cam campaigns. You've omitted cases where rights were unequally bestowed or privileges too hastily curtailed as the result of popular fear. We have a bad habit, all of us, of scapegoating on popular people in times of national stress and abridging their rights. Socialist Eugene Debs was thrown into jail under our Sedition Act for peaceful speeches opposing US involvement in World War I. So since we're remembering World War I, we ought to remember the abridgments of the freedom of speech to which that fear led. Loyal and peaceful Japanese Americans were interned in camps in the run-up to World War II. These are cases where fear not only did not lead in the direction of protecting rights, but where it actually abridged rights that had already been established. And the same climate of fear prevented even our courts from seeing that until much later. Well, Dee says, once again, I await your arguments. You've persuaded me there's a problem, but I don't yet see how big it is. But here's another thing. You use the title, The Monarchy of Fear, and you keep saying that fear poses a special problem for democracy. What I don't get is the particular connection you draw between fear and a threat to democracy. To the extent that fear is a problem, doesn't it threaten all forms of government equally? So Martha says, well, actually, no. In a monarchy, well, the monarch, of course, can't be too fearful. But monarchs feed on fear from below. Fear of the monarch's punishment ensures submissive compliance. And fear of outside threats ensures voluntary servitude. Fearful people want to run to the monarch for protection and care. They turn to a strong, absolute ruler in times where they feel threatened and helpless. In a democracy, by contrast, we have to look one another in the eye as equals, and a horizontal trust must connect citizens. Trust is not just reliance. Slaves can rely on the master's brutal behavior. But of course, they don't trust the master. Trust means the willingness to be exposed, vulnerable, to allow your future to lie in the hands of your own fellow citizens. Absolute monarchs don't need or want trust. Think again about a marriage in an old-style patriarchal marriage. Well, there was no need for trust. The patriarch was like a, a, a monarch. Spouse and children just had to knock, knuckle under. But the marriages to which people typically aspire these days are different, requiring trust and reciprocity. And trust is undermined by fear. To the extent that I see you as a threat to my life and my projects, I'm going to dissemble and protect myself against you rather than trust you. So too in politics. That refusal of trust is happening all over the US, but also all over Europe now. 
my students don't trust anyone who voted for Trump. They don't even want to talk to that person, even though it might be half of the university student population. And they view such people as like a hostile force. Many Trump supporters, of course, return the compliment, seeing students and universities as a whole as a threat and subversive enemies of real people. And here's another side to the connection between fear and monarchy. When people feel fearful, they grasp after control. They can't stand to wait and see how things play out. They need to make other people do what they want them to do. So when they're not seeking a benign monarch to protect them, they're all too likely to behave monarchically themselves, trying to control others. In this way, too, fear erodes the sort of reciprocity that's needed if democracies are to survive. And it leads often to retributive anger, which divides when what is most needed is a constructive approach to an uncertain future. Well, Dee, who's been quiet much longer than my colleagues would have been quiet, says, well, you mentioned anger, and that makes me ask another question. Why this emphasis on fear? Aren't there many emotions that threaten democracy? What about anger, in fact? Shouldn't we worry about that emotion even more than about fear, given its aggressive tendencies? People also think of envy as a major threat to democracy, fomenting class conflict. And finally, there's been a lot written about the role of disgust in racism, homophobia, and other forms of stigma and discrimination. And of course, I say right away, well, you're entirely right there. And the chapters of this book actually do indeed address in turn each of these different emotions and their interconnections. But having worked for years on each of these emotions more or less in isolation from the others, I've come to realize that this strategy obscured some very important causal relations among the emotions. So I try to argue that fear is primary, both genetically and causally, and that it's because of infection by fear that these three other emotions turn toxic and threaten democracy. Yes, sure, people strike back out of anger, but what is anger exactly? Where does it come from? Why do people feel that way, and under what conditions? does anger become not constructive but politically toxic? So I think these are the questions that we need to ask about each emotion, and I argue that they all lead back to fear. Well then, of course, Dee asks a more fundamental question. Well, why all this fuss about the emotions? Surely the big problems in American life are structural, and they're problems of laws and institutions that need structural solutions. And these solutions can be implemented through law, whether people feel good about them or not. We don't have to wait for people to become better or more self-aware in order to fix the things that need fixing. Well, of course, I, then answering, totally agree that laws and institutions are crucial. I wouldn't have gone to teach partly in a law school if I didn't think that. And I do have views about those issues which do emerge in the book. But Laws can't be enacted or sustained without the hearts and minds of people. In a monarchy, that's not the case. A monarch can simply make things happen and make people do stuff by creating enough fear to produce obedience. In a democracy, we need a lot more. Love of the good, hope for the future, a determination to combat the corrosive forces of hatred, disgust, and rage, all fed, I claim by fear. Well, of course, the real life D would not be satisfied at this point and should not be because I've just made a few claims and not offered arguments and I try to do that in the rest of the book. But still, D should have by now a general sense of where my argument is heading and so I now just summarize. In the next chapter, I do talk about anger and separate it into a part that protests injustice, which I think is always valuable, and the part that seeks pain for pain, the retributive part, which I think is very problematic, and I follow Martin Luther King there in making that separation, and I talk about his the way he did that. Then I turn to disgust, which I've written about quite a bit before, but not 
brought out, I think, enough the connection to fear of one's own embodiment and one's own mortality, which the psychological research does make plain, but then we have to do that to show why then, in the next phase, people don't just have fear of their own bodily waste products and shrink from those in disgust, but they typically project disgust outwards, choosing some subordinate group in society and targeting that group with disgust properties that they impute to them, which of course they have no more than anyone else, bad smell, hyperanimality, hypersexuality. And then these properties imputed falsely are then used to segment and to subordinate. And so I study that reflex and talk about its role in racism against African Americans and in homophobia. I then turn to envy and positional competition, which exists in all societies that do have competition for scarce resources, which is bound to be all. But envy flares up and gets out of hand where a certain group of people feel despair about their access to scarce goods. And I, I actually look at Lynn manuel Miranda's Hamilton to think about the contrast between Burr and Hamilton, which is the contrast between creative pursuit of goods and zero-sum envy. And then uh, argue that in our own time, envy is flaring up because of the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness on the part, in particular, of lower middle class males, although others in solidarity with them. And then, finally, I turn to an issue which makes the interconnections very much more complicated, and that is misogyny. Why is this a moment? And here, I think the US might be slightly different from Europe, where a central political issue is resistance to women's claims, resistance to their voices as they try to talk about sexual violence and sexual harassment. We see this in Trump's many utterances that evince disgust for women's bodies. We see it in the Kavanaugh hearings in which, you know, powerful men were literally shaking, with quivering with a kind of fearful anger at this little woman who came forward and told her story. So I say that actually we have to look to both anger and envy and disgust to find the sources of misogyny in American society. And then finally, in the last chapter, I, I talk about hope. And I say, agreeing with Immanuel Kant, that we actually have a, a moral obligation to do good for others in society. But if we have that moral obligation, we have an obligation to work ourselves up into a mood of hope rather than anomie and despair, because hope also involves action tendencies. It's not just an emotion, but it's a syndrome. And it is needed to propel us into creative action to solve political problems and to get involved in politics in the first place. I then try to say, well, what, what can we do to work ourselves up into a mood of hope? And I talk about the role of the arts, the role of the study of the humanities, the role that for many people is played by religion, let's hope, of the Kantian kind, which we think of as, as constructive and rational, and, and then uh, a lot of other possibilities that have to be constructed locally and among one's own group. So anyway, that's the way the book goes, and it ends on the note of hope, but, but very cautiously, tentatively uh, aware of the magnitude of the obstacles that have been reared against it.